All right, so today we are talking about bug hunting and exploit development. So this is quite an interesting topic and um, from what we cover in today's lecture and the, the labs related to this, you will understand how exploit development works. So you'll be able to go and find a vulnerability in a piece of software and write a Metasploit module to actually exploit that vulnerability that you've discovered. So um, there's, there's obviously quite a lot of content and it's all quite interesting and also quite technical. Um, but we're gonna, I'm, I'm really focusing on the um, beginner kind of level of writing a, an exploit and there are more technical um, details that we could get into but that, um, that we're not essentially. I'm going to give you an overview of some of the stuff like if you are trying to exploit um, Windows 10 with all the latest um, security features and there are some extra things that you need to do while, while developing exploits but all the stuff that I'm going to show you is going to work against a whole range of operating systems um, and I'm also going to mention which ones include um, protections that make things a bit more tricky. So in order to avoid introducing software um, vulnerabilities, when you're doing development you need to think about security and we talked all, all about that last week and the sorts of steps you can do to try and avoid introducing bugs into your software in the first place. But inevitably security mistakes get made, it's you know often it's like a one-line program mistake that results in um, security problems. Um, so what we're talking about is existing code and maybe it's just code that is still in development but that we want to do some testing on to see if we can find something or we can take someone else's code and apply all these things to try and find bugs in existing software. So this is the things you can do with or without access to the source code. So um, the fact that you don't have, your so have the source code doesn't stop you from finding security problems. Um, there are things you can do with the source code that you can't, can't do without and we'll also talk about that a little bit as well. So once you actually find a vulnerability you can go and produce some proof like a proof of concept code that demonstrates that it's a security problem. So you can write an exploit for example for Metasploit to demonstrate yes look there's a problem and this is how you actually would take advantage of it to do something. Um, or you could go and actually just write the code, fix the code, fix the problem and you could send that to the de developers and go hey I found a problem and here's how you fix it. So there are some advantages and disadvantages to each approach. If you don't have an exploit a lot of people a lot of the time will just say that's not a security problem, it's just a crash. You know you can say look I've overwritten um, the you know instruction pointer and therefore it's a security problem and they'll go no it's not. I mean, if they don't understand the problem, you know, if you write an exploit and say, look, you know, here, I've attacked your code and this is what it can do, that will get their attention a lot quicker than if you just say that there is a potential security problem there. Um, so there are some advantages of writing exploit code. Um, if you write a fix, then obviously that is the perfect solution if you want the software to get fixed. So um, obviously, and that has to do with whether or not the source code is available. So if we're talking about free and open source software, then obviously the source code is available and you can just fix it. But if you're talking about something that's closed source, then you, the, you, know, you don't have the source code, so you probably can't fix it. You can sometimes write a binary patch, which is basically you, you can make changes to the machine code, like level of it, and then you could apply that but that's not really that helpful to most people and is not going to help the software developers probably anyway. So if we're talking about open source software you can just go in and look at the code and fix it or if you obviously if you work for the company if it's closed source. If you are independent and um, you find a problem in closed source software then basically you just need to tell them about it and hope that they believe you that it's a security problem. So zero day is obviously if we find something that's new so if you discover something that no one knows about before, then you've just found a zero day vulnerability. So obviously very serious security ramifications. So if you've got a zero day or an O day, then basically you could go and, you know, if you're a, a black hat, you could go and write a worm that basically, you know, 
spreads across the internet, infecting computers and doing some, you know, doing things with those computers. They might form a botnet and then you can use them to do your evil bidding or whatever. Uh, or you could use them in some kind of targeted attack. Uh, so you could, um, you know, specifically attack, um, say, a bank or something and start emailing staff members and, or, you know, do something that's specifically targeted at someone. Um, and um, so there's all sorts of things. You, I mean, you could sell it on the black market, sell sell the vulnerability you've just discovered. Um, and if you weaponize the attack, then um, you could basically create an exploit, and um, that would be known as a zero-day exploit. Um, so there's no fix possible. But please don't do that. So if you uh, um, find yourself a new vulnerability, then please follow responsible disclosure. So you know, as we've discussed in previous modules, if you've done some of the other security modules, and as um, you know, ba basically that it's a heat hotly debated topic within security um, industry. How do we go about dealing with new vulnerabilities? So responsible or coordinated disclosure is basically when you contact the vendor and you basically give them a time limit. So you say, rather than just telling people, you say you basically you work with them. Uh, and you don't go public straight away. So often you give them a time limit. So you say, you, you know, you've got two months. And then after two months, if you haven't fixed it, you're going to go public with that information. Um, an alternative approach is full disclosure, where you basically just publicly announce everything. And um, that doesn't actually give the, the vendor an opportunity to fix it, which means that, you know, basically black hat hackers can take that information and use it before the vendor has an opportunity to fix it. So I guess you could say, well, why don't you just give the vendor an infinite amount of time to fix it? Well, so, like time has basically taught us that if you give them an infinite amount of time to fix it, and you basically there's no threat of going public, often things won't get fixed, basically. So you say, oh, look, I found this problem, full stop. Some vendors will basically just sit on that. Um, so, yeah, in terms of this module, if you find a um, zero day while you are working on your assignment for this module, here is a vulnerability disclosure policy for you to actually carry out. So while doing this module, this basically I've tried to make it as easy as for you as possible, basically lay out some steps and I've created a template that basically is for you to fill out and then you can use to inform the company that you found a problem. So just make it just to make it as um, straightforward as possible. So basically, there, there's a disclosure template document that's up on the module page. Um, basically, you just replace the yellow fields with a few details of the things, the thing that you found, and you can start by contacting the security representatives within the company. And if you're sending any emails, then CC me in. But basically, you uh, and the details of that are written in the template document. There's some more information that isn't here. Basically, you can contact the security representatives, tell them about the problem. It tells them what the deadline is as well, which is 15 days, and then um, CERT CC is contacted, which gives them an additional 45 days, and then do the release themselves if they find if they believe that it is a serious security vulnerability. So that takes it out of our hands in terms of like actually going public with the information, but they. Um, CERT will do that for us basically and publish the information if they haven't fixed it in that amount of time. So also you would then apply for a CVE which will look great in your um, CV um, and then after and not before 15 days after step two you'll report to CERT the information if they haven't already like basically satisfied you um, and then after that, they, they will release the, the, inf the details publicly and then after that point you can blog about it or, you know, whatever, write about it and um, release your exploit code or whatever. So there is some more information on the module page and in the template. Uh, if you want to do something different, then um, talk to me about it first before you do something. So um, yeah. So how do you go about finding a bug? So if you've got access to source code, you can obviously look at the source code and read it very carefully and see whether you can spot any of the types of security vulnerabilities that we've talked about. 
um, you know, in the last couple of weeks. There's also static analysis, where you can basically use software to automatically analyze the code and look for problems. And whether or not you've got access to the source code, you can also do reverse engineering. So you can take, um, if you've got a binary of the program, you can try and figure out what it does by looking at the, the actual executable file. Um, and you can also do binary static analysis sometimes, so you could try and reverse engineer. You can use a disassembler to take the binary file and generate something approximating what the source code is, and then you could run that through a static analysis tool. And you can do fuzz, fuzzing, which does like random testing, uh, and we're going to talk about that in detail. So static analysis first is um, <clears throat> basically it does its automatic way of detecting common programming mistakes. It's really good for detecting certain types of programming errors. So for example, buffer overflows and memory errors and using functions you shouldn't be using and things like that. They're very good at detecting that sort of stuff. Um, but some of the tools have very high positive rates, uh, f false positives. So it will basically tell you there's a whole bunch of problems and actually when you look at it closely, it's not a security problem. But it does flag a lot of stuff up and some of the tools are designed to try not to have too many false positives. Um, they're, they're not going to detect everything, but they are a really good thing to use. So if you are a programmer and you're working to develop sort, you know, some source code, then you should con seriously consider using static analysis in the development stage of your project. Um, but also, if you've got access to the source code, you can run it through the tools. So there are lots of tools. Some of them are open source. <coughs> Others, are, um, there's loads of closed source proprietary tools you can pay for as well. Some of the um, the good um, FOSS tools include CPP check, um, which aims for zero false positives, so it tries not to give you alerts that aren't true, uh, which isn't true of all of them. There's like Floor Finder, Rats, uh, Visual Code Grepper, and Oink, which includes a, um, a static analysis tool. There's loads of other tools, like seriously. That, so there's a Wikipedia link there, which you can look at. There are, you know, there, there's just loads of tools you can use. But because they all do this in different ways, it is a really good idea to combine them. So if you want to be more likely to find something, you could use, you know, maybe choose two of the tools to run, run it through, or, you know, more than one, basically. Um, and just as a side note for your assignment, um, the it doesn't hurt to run that theory static analysis first to give you some ideas of the sorts of stuff to look at in your fuzz testing. Uh, it's not going to give you extra marks, but it will quite possibly make this make it easier for you to find something. So there is also um, God, I don't know how to pronounce it. Coverity. Co <laughs> how would you, how would you pronounce that? Um, it's it's a big it's a um, big commercial company that do static analysis and you can pay them to do to, to use their tools to analyze your own source code um, but it's free to use for open source projects so if you're a FOSS project you can um, basically use their online scanner um, and it's been used for um, for a while um, now for a few years to scan lots of projects including like the Linux kernel and you can see um, it's been used to detect loads of loads of um, errors, flat flaws that it's detected. So you can see that, that you know there are currently what over four, apparently four thousand seven hundred sixty-one outstanding issues. Whenever this was published in the Linux kernel, that hadn't been fixed yet. And whether every single one of those issues is a serious security problem, um, I don't know. But you know, obviously, interesting. Uh, there are lots, lots of code. Um, so this is saying that the Linux kernel has um, about 9 million lines of code. Um, and uh, interestingly, FreeBSD has even more code. Um, so, so yeah, you can see that it's been used to detect all sorts of things. So that's static analysis. What about when you don't have access to the source code? Um, fuzzing. So you can use fuzz testing or fuzzing. Um, to basically feed in variations of input into a program. So it tries to create unexpected input to try and uncover unexpected behavior. So software vulnerabilities that might be lurking in the code, one way to find them is basically just to inundate the software with all sorts of weird requests. 